advocate Neema Noor Muhammad. Ma'am is a practicing lawyer in the Supreme Court of India since 2016. Prior to this, she was assistant professor at IMS Law College, Noida. She has practical experience in the trial courts of Palakkar, dealing with matters mainly related to family law and criminal laws. She graduated in microbiology as a gold medalist from Bhartiya University, Coimbatore, and received her bachelor's of law degree from the University of Calicut, securing first rank in the university. She did her master's in law from the premier social legal institute, the Indian Law Institute, New Delhi, and in the year 2015, she backed the highest score in the dissertation on the topic, Dissolution of Muslim Marriage, the Law and Practice, a quest for reforms. Her research work on this contentious topic got published in various international and national law journals. Apart from this topic of Muslim law reforms, issues in the criminal justice system, gender studies, and environmental jurisprudence were presented by her at various conferences across the country. She was associated with today's topic from the beginning and has drafted the concept note as well. I welcome you to share your views. Thank you so much for that introduction of mine. And it's been, uh, it's a privilege for me to be a part of this um, discussion in fact, you know, because uh, as, as was said, as introduced, I was from the very inception on this topic, uh, the moment that we started to think uh, like um, this is very uh, serious and uh, we have to really move uh, from, uh, from, you know, we have to move this really from courts to the parliament. The moment we start, we started, okay, let's first step as lawyers, we have to knock the doors of the justice through courts. And we did that. We uh, drafted, and I was uh, privileged to draft uh, this um, public interest litigation for a uh, Pravasi legal cell, as well as uh, and as as uh, associated with um, uh, Mr. Joseph Ramso for a long time. It's been a. Uh, it was like a, uh, it wasn't like you know doing something for somebody, but for me myself. And uh, um, well, while I was drafting this, you know, apart from being a lawyer. What I could relate more was my dad, who's here today, he was uh, an expat for 31 years abroad. And myself, uh, we were all uh, uh, did our schooling abroad. So, you know, this apart from as uh, senior said, you know, this, this particular issue is not just social legal, but this has something to do with, you know, every party of us, especially Keralites or, you know, South Indians. Who, who are, I mean, mostly, you know, have an expat at home. So, uh, this is a topic which everybody can relate to each of us. And that is the relevance of this topic, and that is why we are all here together, to gather here, to bring out a solution. You know, because as uh, as Senior said, this is something to do with uh, me and you, not just legally, but emotionally. So, uh, taking that note emotionally, I would, um, being a researcher on this issue, I have to speak on, uh, you know, this issue in a, uh, a technical manner, uh, because uh, I was dealing with issue uh, as a researcher, so pro uh, probably I would have dealt it in that angle. So, when I was doing this research, what the first thing that came into me was, I mean, like anybody as a researcher, whose right are we talking about? Who's right? We are talking about the so-called posthumous right. And what is posthumous right? And where do you start? The moment your breath becomes air, the moment you are motionless, because the moment you are like, you cannot do something of yourself, the challenge comes in. And that is what this entire jurisprudence is all about. And I'm, I'm so sorry to say about jurisprudence because uh, as, as a researcher, I dwelt into it much. Uh, so I think um, I have to give a small hint about how this entire theory is all about. So do dead ones have right? That is the first question that I had to ask. See, before as, um, uh, you know, before you place something to a parliamentarian, 
uh, who's here. The first question is like, who's right? Whose right is violated? He's speaking about posthumous bodily integrity. So the question is revolving around a particular subject, a very interesting subject, a dead person. Now, the question is actually a moot question and uh, you know when you go through various literature we find that how far do you extend your basic rights to a dead person? How far, even if you extend that right to that dead person as a person, who will enforce that right? Who will be able to claim that posthumous right? So there are so much things tangled in it which and I was also during our discussions, during the drafting throughout, I was like really stuck. I mean how would you draft such a petition because there are so many questions that need answers which unless you have a clarity, how will we put forward to a larger audience? So this particular thing was striking in all of us and I was like wondering how would we move about. But then somewhere um, we had um, the, since in India we don't have a developed jurisprudence on this area, we had to clinch on Article 21 saying that right to life extends to dead curse. So we, we took the, we derived uh, certain um, orbiters from uh, the so Supreme Court judgments and verdicts. So that is how we somehow managed to bring out a sort of a foundation here saying ki, okay, we are extending this right to dead person. Okay, so this is very technical, very technical. I, I think senior would be like, you know, so, uh, so apart from right, there are certain uh, aspects like claim. Now who will be the next person to say that my particular right has been violated, obviously the dead can't. So somebody should take an agency here, a human agent. So here you are giving or vesting this particular right to somebody. So who is the agent? Now the next question is what interest? Posthumous interest. You know, there are some times, you know, like for instance, um, some people, as as uh, Sina was saying, see, uh, some religions, for some religion, it is a very, um, it's a part of their, um, I mean, what to say, it's a ritual that the ashes has to be, um, I mean, um, it has to be, you know, in the river, uh, has to be, you know, so, uh, you know, there are certain rituals. So, it's all together, you know, it's, it's so much tangled. It's not just uh, legal, it's social, it's religious. And there are a lot of things involved in it, even cultural. Now, the next challenge. So, when we were putting this draft and we were like almost with uh, uh, with the draft and then we were before the court uh, and we are yet the matter of sub -judice. So, we are indeed waiting for the court probably uh, to give us a guideline that what the court can do. But again, the court might ask us, where is the law? Where is the law? Because we are here to interpret. So somewhere, what we lack is a law. So this particular, through this consultation, what we wanted is, <coughs> as there has to be a multidisciplinary uh, discussions on these issues, larger um, stakeholders has to come and have to, you know, deliberate on these issues so that one side the jurisprudence will be taken care by the academicians, we can call for a research paper or something of that sort so that this particular tangled jurisprudence question like the, does the dead have right can be discussed on a larger volume. Second is once you give them the right or if, if this hypothesis gets proved, okay they have a right. Now the next step is for the state, that is the parliamentarians. Now how will they translate this right into an enforceable right? What would the mechanism that you would be trying to enforce or what are the provisions that you would in, you know, impart on this particular uh, right to get enforced? Because as of now we have a lot of constitutional rights, we have a lot of statutory rights. But unfortunately you can see these are all symbolic. We cannot translate into actual justice. Why? Because somewhere the law is stuck because we are not able to make it into action because of the, 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 the involvement of research or deliberation that is not happening in India. The parliamentarians, I would suggest, has to go through a sort of, you know, though we have standing committees, I would suggest academicians who are related to these issues have to be involved for discussions. Maybe you can see if, if, if that is the need, like 
that is the need if we're getting into a larger seminar or research papers or call for papers, you might be able to get apt researchers on this to work on this issue seriously. Because foreign jur when I was doing a literature review, there are a lot many articles in the foreign jurisdictions which is deliberating on this issue extensively. Which in India I couldn't even find hardly a single article on posthumous bodily integrity except post sperm retrieval. That is uh, that is post mortem retrieval. So except that we haven't discussed anywhere on this issue. Maybe because of the um, uh, maybe the discourse is really complicated because more on jurisprudence. Whatever the reason is, but we need a solution. We cannot just make a law and just leave it aside. So we want laws which are practical and logistic. Now the third part of my research was regarding the international law. Here the state, a particular state is not involved. Two states are involved, two, multi, two uh, sovereign states are involved. So what about the laws and uh, you know the procedures that we have to go through. So though we have a mechanism there, but how far we can ease it out through laws. So these were uh, the broader um, things that came into when I was researching. But again, I would say like we are in a very um, good embryonic stage. We have to really develop on this, um, you know, as a theory. Uh, as a theory, then once it's a theorized and it's to practice, and then one to practice and implementation. So um, <coughs> at at large, what is it like? See, for instance, when the actress Sri Devi died in Dubai. There were jet planes, uh, Ambani's uh, uh, were ready to bring her. So the question is now classification of migrants. That was one question that was challenging. Like, who would you classify? Like, who are the needed person? So there are a lot many things involved in it. So see, there has to be uh, a lot many discussions regarding, even if it comes into a law, the procedural aspects. How are you going to deal with these migrants? How are you going to classify them? So there are, as I said, this is just a starting, and I hope uh, the, I mean, the gravity of the issue is now like, I mean, sort of clear because it cannot come and like you cannot just do it in a periphery. It's just scratch it. So we have to move forward. So I guess um, um, maybe because I did a lot of research, I had to speak so much technically. Um, but I, I would feel uh, like um, any comments on this, any queries that you really want to know more on this, um, I'm like always open to have a discussions on it. So and I thank, uh, in fact, you know, I have to conclude because there are a lot many speakers, questions and deliberations coming up. Uh, it is again a privilege to be flanked with such uh, luminaries uh, besides me and uh, thank you Pravasi Legal Cell again to give me a platform to share my ideas. Thank you so much.